everyone. Welcome to day two of the 2020 International E-Conference on Religion and the Holocaust. My name is Dr. Darren Slade. I'm president of the Global Center for Religious Research. I want to say thank you so much for being in attendance today. What is incredible is that you are participating in a conference that's attended by people from all over the world. We have students and academics and scholars from every continent who didn't even have to get out of their pajamas if they didn't want to, to be here today. So thank you for that. One of the great things about our academic conferences is that there's no air travel fees, there's no hotel room fees. You just get to present, you get to attend these conferences and hear the latest research in Holocaust studies from the comfort and safety of your own home. Now with that, I have the distinct pleasure of being able to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Bernice Lerner. And I'd like to share my screen so I can give her a proper introduction. Dr. Bernice Lerner's talk today is going to be on the liberation of Bergen-Belsen and faith in its aftermath. Dr. Lerner is the author of the book called All the Horrors of War, A Jewish Girl, a British Doctor, and the Liberation of Bergen-Belsen. She's the former Dean of Adult Learning at Hebrew College and a senior scholar at Boston University Center for Character and Social Responsibility. She also happens to be the daughter of Holocaust survivor Rachel Genoth. Now, you can learn more about Dr. Lerner at her website at www.bernicelerner.com. Now, I want to highlight her book in particular, All the Horrors of War, which traces the story of her mother, Rachel Ginuth, a poor Jewish Hungarian teenager, one of the youngest Holocaust survivors, and her encounter with a British army doctor by the name of Hugh Hughes. As her mother, Rachel, attempts to survive and fight to save her own life as Hugh Hughes fights to save the lives of thousands of other survivors. And with that, I want to turn it over to Dr. Bernice Lerner. Thank you so much for being with us today. It's all yours. Thank you so much, Darren. And thank you for all your terrific work. And thank you to the other presenters whom I've enjoyed listening to. And I hope to hear more when uh, the recorded sessions are out. Uh, I have a slide presentation, so I'm going to open that up now. So um, I'm going to talk about the liberation of Bergen-Belsen and faith in its aftermath. And here you see uh, Rabbi Isaac Levy and Rabbi Leslie Hardman, uh, chaplains who are praying at the one of the mass graves. Um, you may know that Bergen-Belsen was the largest concentration camp at the end of the war. The British uh, came upon it. They were it was handed over to them by the German second Ar by the German army, and it was a very unprecedented, unusual thing for a concentration camp to be turned over to the Allied forces. And they came, and there were ten thousand unburied uh, bodies and people dying every day. So just a word about the religious faith among Holocaust victims and survivors, and I'm going to talk particularly about what happened at Bergen-Belsen, but we all have to realize that there was a before. Um, people came from every kind of background. Some were very observant and some were completely secular. There was a during the Holocaust, which was sort of a watershed event if people were lucky enough to survive it. The, a few who did, there was an after. And what did it do to their faith? There are as probably as many ways of surviving as there are survivors. And I think that some people who were reared in the orthodox way or very traditional before did have a break. Uh, some adhered to their, to their traditions, they went back to them. But of course, in the concentration camp, it was impossible in order to survive. So um, thank you, Darren gave me such a nice introduction. He talked about my book, All the Horrors of War, where I basically trace uh, the journey of my mother and this uh, Brigadier Glenn Hughes, who was um, masterminded the liberation, uh, the relief efforts at Bergen-Belsen. And just, I just want to show you these two images here because the book, it's just kind of interesting to see what publishers do with it. So it's the same manuscript. 
the same photos were furnished for the covers, but uh, All the Horrors of War is the US edition and To Me in Hell is the UK edition. And you can see uh, the girl, that's Rachel Guinuth, my mother, and that's uh, several months after the liberation of Bergen-Belsen. She's 15 years old and in that picture, um, she is in a tuberculosis sanitarium in Sweden. And the top is, on this image is top on one, bottom of the other is Glenn Hughes in his caravan at Bergen-Belsen doing some of the work. Could have been writing out five different types of diets to feed the emaciated. So the story takes place, I tell the story in the book over one year's time. Uh, my mother starts. Uh, my mother starts in the east of Europe as she travels. As she's taken from our hometown of Siget to Auschwitz, and then to a labor camp, and then on a death march, and then finally put on a cattle wagon or open car train the last week and deposited, like so many of the war ravaged in Bergen-Belsen. Uh, Germans were trying very hard to get the remaining prisoners in the slave labor camps away from the al liberating allies. And then Glenn Hughes, you could see he starts off in that year before the war in training um, in, in uh, the Yorkshire walls of England. And then he is deputy director of medical services for the British Eighth Army and they travel and he plans the D-Day evacuations of casualties, he commandeers hospitals, he go, He follows with his 8th Corps uh, in up through France and to Belgium and to Germany. And finally, by the time he lands in Bergen-Belsen, he has been promoted to Deputy Director of Medical Services for the entire British Second Army. So on April 15th, 1945 is the day the British enter Bergen-Belsen. Uh, you'll see um, that there are signs that there is a contagion. Uh, there is typhus is very contagious. Dust spreads typhus and they're very careful going in. You'll see on the bottom right, there's a picture of the camp. I don't show you the most graphic images. If, you are interested, you could probably go to Google Images, but here is a, an image of the camp with the road dividing the five compounds in the main camp, the, uh, which is the horror camp. There's three on one side, two on the other, and prisoners were made to those who, in the days before the liberation on April 11th or 12th, the Nazis had those who still had a little bit of life in them. Maybe they were, my mother would say she was 50% dead. They had to drag the corpses down the middle of the road to a mass grave at the end of the uh, end of the road. And some people were still even breathing at that time. It was a, a place of great obscenity and uh, I really tremble talking about, about Bergen-Belsen because I know that it was indescribable. I haven't heard a survivor or a liberator talk about it without saying those words. It was just indescribable. And the British Army came with uh, its a uh, film and photography unit and took lots of pictures it was probably the most documented liberation and what, what the scene looked like. And, even the cam cameraman had very great difficulty doing this job, but we have a lot of images, but no image could show how it was. So here are just a few of those images. Again, a, a, a chaplain at the uh, edge of a mass grave. And on top of that, you see the SS who remained in the camp. A certain number of SS remained in the camp to orchestrate the turnover they were forced to load the bodies, the skeletons, onto trucks to bring to the mass grave, and they were forced to bury them. And on the um, upper right and lower right, you'll see that the British Army, three days after they entered, they set up a bunch of tents, all very near to the huts in the camp, to try to alleviate the overcrowding in the huts and get some food and water to those too sick to move. And they could do this by 
saying that those who were ambulatory could still walk could go out to sleep in the huts. And that's a very significant part of my mother's story and her near death and, and a really amazing survival is that she was, she was well enough to go into a hut, um, but then for various reasons, her hut mates kicked her out and she had to crawl back to, she was well enough to go to a tent and then she had to crawl back to the hut. So you could just sort of see the distance between the tent and the huts. And that's in my book. And then the rescue, it was done sort of factory style. They, they, um, there were 60,000 inmates, 41,000 in the horror camp. Uh, how were they going to disinfect everybody, get rid of the typhus? They had to have a system and they, they did it person by person, evacuating seven people, 700 people from a hut each day. Uh, you see the men are protecting themselves from the, um, the soldiers from the 11th light field ambulance who are doing this rescue work or wearing suits. So they try to protect themselves from the typhus. Uh, stripping people, taking them to a place they call the Human Laundry, which is on the bottom right. And it was a former cavalry stables that they set up with 60 tables. They didn't have enough person power, so they corralled German nurses and from the surrounding area, and they were supervised by British uh, by British Army men. And they had to clean all the skeletal bodies and soak them down and wash them and spray them with DDT to kill the typhus germ. And then when they were clean, they wrapped them in clean blankets and took them to makeshift hospital. And finally, finally, it took several weeks. Um, the rescue really, that really evacuation to this makeshift hospital, and I won't go into the details of what it took to set up, a hospital area and try to get all the supplies needed and the personnel, which was, oh, it was, there was a severe shortage, which contributed to the death toll. Um, it all took place um, over several weeks. And finally, on May 21st, when the last hut was evacuated, um, they, they burned it down. They had an effigy of Hitler on it and Glenn Hughes gave the order and they torched the hut and burned it down. And uh, Glenn Hughes was a much loved figure. I talk about him a lot in my book and um, the survivors felt his warmth and his kindness um, and he had broken down crying on, at several points um, even though he had been so war hardened and had seen such terrible things in battle. He had seen all the horrors of war but nothing to touch Bergen Belsen. Anyway, the survivors named the hospital, the biggest hospital on the, on the, really in the continent of Europe. They had like more than 13,000 patients at one point, the Glenn Hughes Hospital. So here's just a, pro, uh, a few numbers. Um, uh, I will really, if you, um, Go down to the bottom, you'll see there's 55,000 to 60,000 sick and dying prisoners found in Bergen-Belsen at the time of the liberation. Two thirds were women, one third men. There were about four to 500 children. 25,000 were deemed fit, able to walk, and they were taken to a transit and rehabilitation camps very nearby. Um, they called it Camp 3. And there was back and forth because some of them that appeared fit wound up very sick and had to go to the hospital and vice versa. Um, 750 to 1,000 sick were processed each day for over three weeks in the human laundry. 500 inmates died each day for a month after the liberation. That's an average. Two weeks, it took two weeks for the backlog of corpses to be buried in Bergen-Belsen in these mass graves. So um, what happened then, uh, what faith after this horrible thing happened. So it was really quite remarkable because while mourning incalculable losses, survivors, nearly all of whom had lost most of their relatives, 
formed a vibrant displaced persons community. This happened pretty quickly. The devout and the secular, those who had lost faith and those who held fast to Jewish, Jewish precepts united around a common goal to create a meaningful narrative of their sufferings by turning their sights to a Jewish homeland and to a future in which they could live normal lives. And I'm going to play you a video now. This is quite remarkable. This is of uh, a, a tape of survivors singing a song of hope, the Hatikva, the anthem of Israel, the, a song of hope, the Hatikva, at the first Sabbath service at Bergen Belsen. It was taped. So let me try to get you that video now, and you can you can see it. Seven years ago today, a remarkable recording was made in the German concentration camp of Bergen-Belsen. The recording became part of a radio report on the liberation of that death camp that was filed by Patrick Gordon Walker, who worked for the BBC. This is London calling North America. The day I reached Belsen concentration camp, the fifth day of liberation, was a Friday, the day before the Jewish Sabbath. Something like half the surviving prisoners at Belsen were Jews, and the Jewish chaplain to the British Second Army, the Reverend L. H. Hardman, held an eve of the Sabbath service in the open air in the midst of the camp. It was the first Jewish service that many of the men and women present had taken part in for six years. It was probably the first Jewish service held on German soil in absolute security and without fear for a decade. Around us lay the corpses that there had not been time to clear away, even after five days. 40,000 or more had been cleared, but there were still one or two thousand around. And people were still lying down and dying in broad daylight in front of our eyes. This was the background to this open-air Jewish service. During the service, a few hundred people gathered together, sobbing openly with joy at their liberation and with sorrow at the memory of their parents and brothers and sisters that had been taken from them and gassed and burned. These people knew they were being recorded. They wanted the world to hear their voice. They made a tremendous effort which quite exhausted them. Listen. <laughs> So um, that was pretty remarkable that they got that on record. And um, this is a picture about, I mean, a few days after the liberation, um, young, certain young people began to emerge as leaders to try to unite all these survivors from disparate backgrounds, religious backgrounds, uh, from all walks of life. Um, in, on, around a common goal. And here you see on the left, this man, Yosef Rosensaft, he was, he was a diminutive man. He was small, but he was a very powerful leader. He had been involved in Zionist youth organizations before the war, as had the other, some others who had emerged as leaders. And he was able to unite, to unite these survivors of Bergen-Belsen who were mourning so much. But at the same time they were mourning, they were looking to create families anew. Most of them, my mother was very young. She was only 15 years old at the end of the war. But the vast majority of them were of marriageable age and they were looking to partner and meet other, meet someone else and, and rebuild anew. They had, they, they had faith in their future, even though they had been through so much, they wanted to, 
rebuild the Jewish people. So this is a ketubah uh, from Bergen Belsen, a Jewish marriage contract. And it is, there are like lines for spaces. So this wasn't just for an individual, this is for many people. And the rabbis at the time were struggling with this issue. What happens if they, they met someone and very quickly they decided usually to get married. They were coupling up very quickly. What happens if they, they were, their spouse wasn't killed before the war? Like what happens if they somehow surface after the war? Because nobody knew what happened to their spouse. People didn't know the fate, their fate. Were they killed? They sort of assumed they were killed because what they had seen in Bergen-Belsen and what they knew of from Auschwitz and the other death camps that the odds of their spouse having survived were very slim and they were looking to get remarried, but there had to be some sort of something in the ketubah that said that if, uh, if their former spouse, if they had been married before and their former spouse uh, had survived, and they married this new person, they would have to go to a Beit Din, a court of Jew, a Jewish court of justice, to decide to work things out in terms of their whatever assets they might accumulate or anything like that. And 420 men and 300 women who had been married and didn't know the fates of their spouses were granted permission to remarry in this way. And they were looking to pair up, so you see very quickly, I mean, there's everyone has their own individual story. There's one story I heard of a woman who finally, when she got a little bit better, she went to the hospital to take care of the patients. And one of the patients was a man, and he, she barely had any desire to be with the opposite sex, only slowly was that being rekindled. But he said to her on his, his sickbed, he said, let's, would you marry me? And she said, sure. And people got married and it, there were so many weddings. Um, there were a thousand, at least a thousand weddings in the camp. And here you see some images of the people right away having babies. And there was a little kindergarten set up in the camp. And within a couple of years after the liberation, the life of the camp centered around the small children and the families. And um, here is, I don't know if I have time. Do I have time, Darren, to show one more video, let's say? Hello, okay. Oh, yeah, absolutely, you got plenty of time. Okay, so I'm gonna show a, um, I'll show a um, video talking about um, the children born in Bergen-Belsen. So this was a remarkable story of faith. Um, these survivors, just what faith they had that they were going to rebuild. And that was the case for many of them. And even some of the, I know of one woman who got pregnant and she married, got pregnant quickly and didn't want the baby she was 
so traumatized by what she had seen happen to babies in Auschwitz. But then once the baby was born, it was so meaningful and, and to rebuild. Now, this was not my mother's trajectory. She was 15 years old and she couldn't, she watched, she could observe. Well, she was in a makeshift hospital at Bergen-Belsen for in and out for several weeks. And when she finally got to the DP camp, she could only observe the older people walking around trying to make themselves look presentable, um, tailoring their garments and matching up. But she was very young and she couldn't make a single decision for herself. So um, very fortunately, the Swedish Red Cross came in. The Swedish government decided to take in about 7,000 of the very sick uh, survivors from Bergen-Belsen and rehabilitate them. And my mother was one of them and her sister and they had tuberculosis. My mother was in and out of TB sanatoriums for 10 years in Sweden, mourning and slowly coming back to life. So this is the final picture. I'll just show you. It's an epilogue of my book. My book is only one year of these people's lives. It's the most dramatic last year of World War II. But at the end, I have a chapter and an epilogue, and I talk a little bit about Glenn Hughes on the upper left, who that's him at the time of the liberation. On the upper right is the first picture we have of my mother. We don't have any pictures of her from her childhood or from before the war. That was the first picture taken of her um, in a um, hospital in Katrina Home, Sweden. And you can see that uh, she was black and blue under her eyes. She was very severely beaten up by her fellow inmates at the end of the war, which is part of the story about the tent and the hut. And that's the first picture we have of her. And then to the left of that is the picture of her and her sister, the only person in her family she survived with when they come to themselves as young adults in Sweden, maybe five or six years later. And next to that is a picture of my father and one of his coworkers in a displaced persons camp in Germany. He's also a survivor, had a different uh, type of experience. And that's a picture of my parents' wedding beneath that, which was in 1955. And on the bottom right is my mother today. Um, thank God she's 90 and she's well and she speaks to she speaks to groups of children from all over the country through the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center on Long Island. Mm -hmm.